Welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining me today um, for this introduction to Mahara. A number of you I know already have been using Mahara for a while and so it's really great to see you again and please do feel free to use the chat um, if you want to add something um, to what I'm saying whether it is um, something special that you are doing um, want to share a link to a portfolio that has been created at your institution or to guides or anything like that please do feel free to do so um, and also um, please feel free to interrupt me I'll try to keep an eye on the chat to see if there are any questions um, but if I for some reason don't react please do feel free to jump in my name is Christina Hopner and um, I live in Wellington, New Zealand, working for Catalyst um, in New Zealand and um, working there on the Mahara project. I have been in New Zealand um, since um, mid-2010 and work in Wellington, um, so kind of in our map here, right in the smack bank in the middle. And uh, Catalyst also has offices in Auckland and Christchurch across the pond um, in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne and we also have a couple of offices in Europe. Our Canadian office does not quite yet have a location um, because of all the pandemic that had been happening this year so that it wasn't quite possible yet to establish the office as such as in a building um, but we now uh, could also already welcome colleagues um, in Catalyst, or for Catalyst Canada and it's great to see um, what they are doing over there and therefore allows us to have another presence. So since Ma uh, June 2010 I have been working directly with the Mahara project team. Uh, Mahara itself was established in 2006 um, as project by a number of universities um, and polytechnics here directly in New Zealand because um, they I had said that a learning management system is not enough, um, that students should have the possibility to control their learning, to decide what they want to keep off their learning, um, be that formal, informal or any other experiences that they've had and therefore created Mahara um, as personal learning environment. Personally, I had come across Mahara already in 2008 um, back when I was at the University of Luxembourg and had started working with the platform then in one of the bachelor programs. So it's really fantastic to have seen the growth of Mahara over the years and um, since mid-2010 then have been able to participate in the development of the product more closely and also therefore be able to shape the product, work with the community in terms of um, making enhancements, putting features in that um, make a difference um, for people's portfolio work and therefore support them throughout the years as project lead and also community facilitator. Mahara is not just present in Aotearoa, New Zealand though. Um, there are lots of people around the world that work with the software. And so we do have instances of Mahara through the community on all continents but Antarctica. If you do have any connections there, please do let me know because we do have the possibility to start creating portfolios offline, um, in particular the evidence collection and therefore um, internet bandwidth or Wi-Fi or satellite internet connections wouldn't be stressed as much as it were the case if you didn't have such an app available. Here you can see all the uh, MACs, the Mahara user groups um, that are established around the world. Um, of course, there is quite a concentration over in Europe, in particular uh, Great Britain, because there are lots and lots of enthusiasts of Mahara that are also very active in the community 
um, organizing events. Um, there's just been a virtual event earlier in the year um, and also sometimes face-to-face -face events. The French community is also very active. Um, lots of universities use Mahara there. In Germany, we also have a mug that organizes an event every single year. Um, this year, Hui, uh, yeah, Mahara Hui Dach will happen on the 28th of November online um, and also welcomes guests from Austria and Switzerland and other parts of Europe. Um, the conference languages are typically German and English, so everybody is welcome to attend. The Japanese community is also very active with Mahara, um, organizing an event every single year and sharing their development works, their portfolio work and um, how they use it also in particular in the university sector. We also have um, community groups in Canada, the United States and Australia besides ours, of course, here in New Zealand. And um, there are loose collaborations between community members um, who can come together and uh, discuss local topics, but also more global ones. And as we've seen over the last few months, everything has gotten a little bit more global due to the possibilities of um, online events and therefore um, sharing more widely and also making it possible for people from very different areas to come together and connect with each other. So today we are going to talk about Mahara as a portfolio system or a portfolio platform. And um, they, of course, the, the big part for us is portfolio. And so how is it distinguished from a content management system? Why do we need a portfolio system when we already have blogging software, when we have the possibilities to set up websites and the like? Well, for me, that kind of in, in a way boils down to really this fantastic quote um, by Vicky Suter adopted from the work of Helen Chen, um, who had, who was a uh, formidable e-portfolio researcher from the United States, um, who really brings it to a very good point of why we need portfolios. And that doesn't just go for electronic portfolios, but portfolios in general. And these days, of course, oftentimes they are electronic because that also makes it easier to collect um, our artifacts and to organize them. And so the idea of folio thinking is that it is a process of engaging in the collection, organization, reflection and connection that leads to a person's ability to speak intelligently and concisely, i.e. tell stories about one's learning experiences, what they mean and their value, and how the experiences relate one to each other. And so the important words here are really the collection, organization, reflection, and connection. That leads to storytelling and allowing us to relate experiences one to another. Because learning doesn't happen in isolation. Learning happens when we engage with others, when we think back of what we had done before, what went well, what didn't go so well, what we might want to change, and then connecting that also to other learning experiences. And the very big difference there is all of that together, but in particular, I find the reflective element and um, that is something to really take a look at when, when you review portfolios that you have gotten from students, either paper-based portfolios or electronic ones. Do you have that reflective element in there? Or is it more like a summary or a project outline? Do, does the student get deeply into um, their learning and reflect on that? If you're now kind of looking at this definition and then seeing, well, what could be the activities, the main activities that we want to look at um, when we are having a portfolio, um, they are for me five C's. Five activities that luckily in English start all with a C to make them easy to remember. And these are the following. 
create. That is one of the elements that is not present in the full you thinking um, definition because that is given as a premise, as a, as a baseline. Um, I think if we are looking at the entire four portfolio process, I do want to bring it in because it is that creation of artifacts or the experience of learning and gathering con or having content available on which to reflect. That is the basis and therefore it is one of the activities that um, yeah, is part, part of the portfolio process. And of course, once we get to the portfolio, it is oftentimes that's where it starts with the collection um, that we can collect all our learning evidence. But the portfolio is not just um, our hard drive where we might also already organize things into folders or tag content. Um, really, the important part is the curation of that content so that we decide what represents my learning best out of these 10 or 20 or 30 pieces of evidence. Because we have to see oftentimes we are creating a portfolio for an audience and that can be an instructor when it is an assessment portfolio or also um, a learning portfolio. It can be a group of learners with whom we share our work or that can be the public. And so it would be quite um, teach us to go through all the learning evidence of a person and do that a hundred times with all the other students. And therefore it is always good to focus on the important things, to focus on the elements that really illustrate the point that I want to make. And that's why it is the curation and the reflection on the learning. And because learning doesn't happen in isolation. We learn with other people and through other people, their experiences and they learn from us. We also have the cons uh, conservation uh, conversation in there um, and conversing with others about our portfolio. And that kind of is the portfolio itself already. However, Mahara goes beyond that and looks beyond that social element of talking with people about my portfolio and allows you also to connect with them and to set up communities of practice by using Mahara groups and um, talking, uh, discussing topics, but also creating portfolios together so that it really also becomes a shared experience. And so if you're taking these five activities, we have a definition, we have some action verbs that we can use in order to talk about portfolios and what we want to put in there and what actions we want to perform on the portfolio. Now, what could be a good metaphor? And those of you that have already been working with portfolios, please feel free to put in the, the metaphors that you're using into the chat. Um, I'd like to briefly talk about the portfolio as a museum metaphor, because that really inter um, tells the story of folio thinking very nicely. Lots of people talk about the portfolio as a museum. Um, We've kind of going from the starting point of um, how many mentors uses it at Messi University. Therefore, it's a museum or gallery. And um, you are welcome to use this image um, that my colleague Yvonne created in order, to, um, if you like that metaphor, in order to convey meaning to your students. So if you're looking at this image at the bottom, we have the archive. That is where the collection happens and the organization of all the con um, of all the artifacts that could potentially be shown in the museum upstairs. So when the curator um, is tasked to create an exhibit, they do not drag everything upstairs that they have in the archive and maybe even the stuff that they have in the offsite archive or maybe they even buy something or um, borrow something from another museum in Mahara speak or electronic terms that would be 
an embed code so that you could, for example, put a video into a Mahara page um, that you already have online. No, they are not putting everything up into the exhibit. They select carefully what they want to display. And so they curate the artifacts that they have. And so once they put that all into a room, and that can be all sorts of different artifacts depending on the exhibit and what the focus is of the exhibit. So that can be paintings, that can be um, ceramics, that can be jewelry, might even be a dinosaur, or these days also a digital display that had been created specifically for that exhibit. And what they do is really curate it and tell a story with all of these artifacts. And they do that by arranging them in a particular way, either chronologically or by, uh, by artist or um, any other um, classification that makes sense for this particular exhibit. And then when we go into the museum, we could get a catalog for that exhibit that tells the story oftentimes in text at the start so that we have the context and therefore know why this exhibit came together the way it has been. Um, we might even have the curator take us through the exhibit. Um, that is when a student could then talk about their portfolio during a presentation. Um, or we can go through the exhibit on our own or together with others. If you're going through the exhibit with other people, we are discussing the exhibit. We can give feedback, we can make comments, we think for ourselves what that means to us. And we can also leave feedback for the museum on the exhibits. Oftentimes we can't reach the, the artists, um, but sometimes we can, so we might even meet the artists in the museum. And like in a museum, portfolios are not necessarily available and accessible to everybody. So it could very well be that you in a museum have to pay an entrance fee and other areas might be free. So same thing in the portfolio, you can decide which parts or which portfolio you, so which exhibit hall you want to make available for everybody, for a small group of people, for a private function or which ones you're still working on and therefore nobody else should have access. We also have a second metaphor that is a really, really nice one to, to think about um, and potentially also um, use because it looks at portfolio slightly differently and that is the portfolio as a performance. So dealing with backstage and front stage um, aspects and that idea um, came from Hazel Owen. Um, she's a New Zealand educator and um, she talked about that in her blog. And so here, similarly to the museum, we have multiple performances that are happening or that are being prepared to happen in a concert hall. And um, these are the more public facing ones. So um, when the artists have practiced enough, that's when they um, have a performance and um, invite people in. But before then, they would be practicing all on their own. Here in the left hand uh, corner, we have the singer and her um, piano um, accompanist. And they practice, nobody else has access to it and they are just in a small room for themselves. On the right hand side, for more theater productions, we have the production team and they work together to decide what they want to put up on the stage, um, what um, pops they want to use, um, how they want to portray um, the play, whether to modernize it or keep it the original. Um, and any of those discussions happen as a team and they learn from each other and they work together, collaborate in order to put on the performance. And so those are two ways um, that you can talk about um, portfolios and convey the meaning and how to work with portfolios to your students. There are definitely many, many more metaphors. And if you use a different one, please feel free to share it with the rest of us. 
Now I've kind of talked about um, that reflective element, the curation of the portfolio evidence. And here's a portfolio from Teresa McKinnon that I find exemplifies that really, really well. Um, because she uses words to express that curation. And um, don't worry about reading all the text um, on the page. You can look at her portfolio afterwards. Um, I just want to look at a few of these highlighted terms here. And so she starts out with the point at which I realized. So she has this aha moment. Um, just looking at that particular moment in time. Then also she revisited what she had done before. And she has a highlight. So she's not sharing all her evidence with us, but she is pointing out the, um, the event that was most prominent to showcase the skill and the competencies that she wants to highlight. And also, she received feedback and mentoring that was very helpful for her to enhance her learning, to progress in her professional career. And she included that in her portfolio in order to also point to that and also showcase that she can learn from others. So those are kind of some really um, nice phrases to use and words to use to illustrate that curation and also the reflection on learning. I'd like to show you a few other examples, um, just very briefly, um, because you'll have more time than on your own to go through them, because some portfolios consist of multiple pages, so it'll definitely be, be good to go through them more slowly, maybe even with a colleague of yours, and see um, if you'd be keen to create, have your students create similar portfolios, or if you would take a different approach. And so the, the first one that I'd like to show you is this one here from the University of the Arts London. Um, that is a student who had to take photos and um, whose, whose assignment it was. And so he wrote a very brief description um, at the start of their portfolio. And in this case, on the edit images. University of the Arts London is, of course, an art school, so the portfolios that the students create are very visual. And the university has been using Mahara for many years now um, for its assignments um, where portfolio work is required. So it ties it also in very well with Moodle. If you want to see more examples of that university, and also the diversity, then you can go to uh, click the URL logo, go to the homepage, and there are a number of pictures, and each picture represents one portfolio. So you can explore a lot of public portfolios. Because for us, we can only show you public portfolios and not um, private ones because um, only those are also accessible to others. An example where you see more of where we have phil philosophy students or a philosophy student create a portfolio in uh, humanities. Um, this one consists of multiple pages that are easily accessible through the collection navigation. That's where the student has quite a lot of text on their page, but they break it up very nicely by using stylistic elements of um, larger font size and other styling elements. And you also see they can work very well with citations and include those in their text. One example that showcases a lot of um, ways of working with a portfolio more as a um, teaching resource is this one here from my colleague um, up in, in the UK, Sam Taylor, um, whom some of you already know. 
uh, where she's created resources that you're very welcome to check out as well and um, showcases functionalities of Mahara while doing so, namely embedding a slide show um, so that you can go through it very nicely and have a large visual element at the top and then shows us the, the mission of the page and then all other elements are more or less hidden and only the headings are visible, um, allowing us to focus on what we want to look at. And then um, if once we are interested in knowing more about this particular point, we can click the heading and then read the remaining text without kind of seeing everything in one go. So that is a really nice example of how to work with um, our varied functionalities for page building um, in order to keep the attention of people and uh, make it also interesting to look at. And besides that, she has some really great resources as well that you can download in order to get started with your portfolio work quickly. One last example that I want to share um, is the portfolio of, um, for nurses that um, uh, District Health Board here in New Zealand, Waitemata DHB, has been creating. And while you can't look at this portfolio itself, you can see extracts in the presentation that I linked um, in the slides to which you will have access. So this portfolio, or this, the nursing portfolio in general, is very formalized. So every nurse needs to fill in the compliance and the competencies. And um, therefore, the learning technologies team, the L&D team, decided to create a template for that portfolio so that nurses could um, get started immediately and very quickly. So here you also see um, a number of new features that we've put into Mahara 2010. So that's why some of you were thinking, oh, how can I get this portfolio completion uh, progress bar and sign-offs into my portfolio? You can upgrade to Mahara 2010. So if I take a look at one of the uh, competency pages, I can see very easily how the page is set up because they've used um, instructions, very detailed instructions, so that the nurses do not have to consult anything else um, in order to know what they need to do on this portfolio. And also um, peer reviewers know what they need to do. Then um, they have the individual competencies listed using the retractable functionality so that it's not always there because nurses might already know the indicators pretty well. Um, and then there's the self-assessment and peer assessment next to it. So if I'm the peer, I can assess um, the portfolio. If I'm the nurse, I can put in the self-assessment and don't even need to go to the edit page because I can just um, quickly edit my text blocks while being on the view page, on the display page, making it very easy for the nurses to not accidentally remove any blocks um, or change them or move them around, um, but really focus on their content. And you can hear all about the implementation plan in the presentation um, that is linked in the example. Um, and also that shows very well how you can move from a paper-based portfolio to an electronic portfolio within a year, for example, for a very large organization. And um, the, the team also talks about um, the support that they have given, um, the training material they created in order to make this a successful implementation. And that is also the, the next point directly, that support is incredibly important. Um, because while we hope 
that students can reflect and give constructive feedback, it is oftentimes not the case because they haven't learned it. And therefore scaffolding their portfolio experiences, giving support, also giving support to staff who suddenly need to work with portfolios is incredibly important um, because they need to have that um, assistance in order to rethink their teaching, rethink their learning, rethink activities. Because the implementation of an electronic portfolio, while it is a technology solution, does include more change management and also change in thinking of how to teach. And therefore it is always good when management or a um, board is on board with that new approach to teaching and learning um, in order to have resources and staff available um, that can be committed to that and that can be successfully accessed also by everybody who um, is involved in the program. And so kind of coming back to the technology a little bit, um, what are the advantages of using Mahara? Well, in my view, they are altogether 12 um, rough, big ones. And the, the first one is the learner centeredness. Um, portfolios are for students and created by students and the students or learners in general, they decide what they want to put in there with whom they want to share their portfolios. And of course, if it has to be for um, assessment purposes, they do need to follow the rules a bit, um, but they don't just have to create assessment portfolios, they can create many others. Mahara is versatile. As the examples have been able to, hopefully have been able to give you a very small insight um, into the portfolios is that there are many different ways of creating portfolios in Mahara. You can use a learning portfolio approach. You can have a developmental portfolio coming out of it. You can have an assessment portfolio connected to your learning management system via LTI and then have it assessed within the LMS or via the LMS. Um, it can also be a showcase portfolio and then a portfolio that um, is sent to employers um, or that can be used on internships very many different possibilities and we do not want to restrict people in creating their portfolios. Mahara is social because you can connect to other people, engage with them, um, ask for feedback or give feedback and then also work together with them in groups. You can use multimedia content in an electronic portfolio. And for me, Bahada is oftentimes an aggregator of uh, content because if you already have all your content sitting online in various social media platforms that allow for the creation of content or the uploading of multimedia content, put it in via an embed code, via an iframe. Um, bring in other evidence through an iframe or if you want to reflect on a TED talk, pull that one in, display it um, so that you can have the reflection right next to a talk um, and not have to just provide the link and then go off and lose your way in the um, portfolio. You can also upload multimedia content to Mahara, be that images, audio, video, PDF, and any other files can be uploaded. But um, because of browser um, restrictions, you may not be able to display all content directly there, but in some cases, in particular, um, word processing documents that needs, might need to be downloaded. Mahara is also supportive. And with that, I mean that you're never ever sitting in front of an entirely blank screen. When you're on a Mahara screen, there are always um, guides available, um, either through help icons or through text directly on the screen that shows you what you can do on the page and also what information is required on the page. And that can serve as basic guidance already for students either to create or upload content and then also arrange it. Mahara is accessible 
which I've already talked a little bit about before, um, but it is worthwhile mentioning it again um, because it's uh, becoming more and more Im um, or it's becoming increasingly important um, that organizations use portfolios for assessment purposes, use it for certification and recertification purposes, and therefore have a tool available that allows them that flexibility to create many different portfolios, yet also put it through a very formal process. And that's um, work we've done with clients to support that. Um, very much in terms of making their workflows easier. So that is the tighter integration to the learning management system, for example, um, that is also pulling information from the LMS into the portfolio and um, sometimes even the other way around and then making sure that um, all content is held only once. Mahara is mobile. The website or website itself can be used um, on any mobile devices and there is also a mobile app available actually called Mahara Mobile. Um, we should be having the um, iOS app back up and running shortly because we are going through the last stages of testing um, of the new app. So it will look new, we'll have our um, current branding involved, built on a new technology and still do what it had been doing before, namely be an offline collector of learning evidence so that you can prepare your content on your mobile offline and then once you're back on Wi-Fi, you can just upload everything in your portfolio area. Mahara is also secure um, because an organization decides who shall have access to the platform, who shall be able to get an account, and learners decide with whom they want to share their stories. Because portfolios can be incredibly um, personal, so it is important to know who has access to it and be able to see very easily who has access to it. Mahar is also accessible. Um, we follow the WCAG 2.0 standards, AA standards. Currently, we are investigating what is needed um, to fulfill the remaining 2.1 standards, what we should be changing in Mahara in order to comply with them. And of course, we are also looking into any of the future ones in order to um, make it possible for everybody to use Mahara. Mahara can also be integrated. I've already been talking about LTI and web services a couple of times, and that is the currently are, those are the main sources besides single sign-on um, that can be used to integrate with other systems. So we do have, definitely have the technical possibilities to connect various systems to Mahara in order to take advantage of storing information, for example, only in one place. And Mahara is customizable. You will have seen that on the examples um, that they all have a different theme. And um, that is the biggest customization that people make. Um, but of course, it is also possible to make any other number of customizations. And if you like some of the new features that um, are in Mahara 20.10, but you know that you won't be able to update or upgrade anytime soon, then we can definitely look into how uh, whether the feature or the features you are particularly interested in could actually be also backported to an older version of Mahara. Oftentimes that is definitely a possibility. And therefore giving you early access um, to new features without doing the entire upgrade. And Mahara is portable. Um, being an open source platform, we do believe in the freedom that people have of um, knowing where their uh, data is, um, the freedom of also taking their data with them and um, moving it around. And so Mahara does offer three export formats, um, two that are built in by default, um, that is HTML and Leap2A, the latter allowing a portfolio to be imported into another Mahara instance or another portfolio software that supports Leap2A. And recently we've also implemented PDF support 
on an experimental basis, allowing accounts to be fully exported as PDF files and have uh, documents that are referenced in portfolios exported as files separately so that they do come along and can be accessed rather than just like a printout where you can't really see anything. So those were my 12 reasons and our uh, 12 ad reasons for going with Mahara, our 12 advantages. Um, there are many different sub advantages, of course, as well. Um, but these ones cover a lot of different areas. So if I haven't convinced you yet to go with ePortfolios, maybe one of those um, freely downloadable or accessible um, publications will convince you. Um, to give electronic portfolios a go. These publications do not specifically talk about Mahara all the time. Um, often there is a, an example for Mahara included, um, but they are really um, created by the wider community um, to foster conversations around portfolios, to show um, also management or an executive in particular, why portfolios are important, what should be considered for implementing portfolios, different approaches to portfolios. So as in particular, if we are looking at publication two, the learning portfolio, and then number three, the e-portfolio based assessment, there are two different types of portfolios. And there you got to get a very good insight in short publications around these types and also how organizations around the world um, work with those. The fourth publication on the right hand side, Digital Ethics Principles in ePortfolios version one, um, is the latest project of um, the ABLE community um, where we've been looking at digital ethics and portfolios and um, coming up with a number of principles that um, organizations might want to consider when working with portfolios. The ones, the 10 that you can see here are the 10 of the first year. We just started year number two, um, where we will be looking into other areas that we haven't touched on yet in regards to digital ethics or that have only been um, talked about very um, in a very small fashion. And therefore, I look forward to working with that uh, group of people to go more deeply again into uh, digital ethics and supporting the community and providing guidance and principles and strategies around those um, to yeah, bring those ideas across and to also ensure that ethics are respected when creating portfolios. Now, if that um, interested you, you have, might already have your Mahara instance and just want to see what's new in Mahara 20.10, um, you're very welcome to join one of those online sessions next week in order to get an overview and an idea of um, all the new things that we've put into Mahara um, in this October version, because we are releasing twice a year, once in April, therefore 20.04, and then in October 20.10 for this year um, that you can see what we have been up to over the last half year and um, take a look at some of those new things. And if you want to get in touch but don't yet have my email address, here you can find it. And um, I'd love to hear what you're doing with portfolios, um, how you're keeping up. Maybe you are also willing to share some of your stories. And if you are at the starting um, point, how can the community help you? Or how can we specifically in the Mahara Project core team assist you with your questions, with your implementation in order to support you making that a success? <laughs>